right? Just, you have to call to order. And then take roll. <laughs> okay, I'll call the meeting to order at 6.01. Yeah, because now it's 6.01, almost. On June 27th, 2023. So roll call. Um, so roll call, Commissioner Bonson's here. Commissioner Engelbrett. Commissioner Bradley. Commissioner Moore. Okay. Um, and then approval of last meeting's minutes. Do I have a motion? What do we do if I was the only one here? Can I make that motion? Um, yeah, you can probably continue that to the next meeting. All right. We'll continue the minutes to the next meeting okay. and then move on to the next piece, which is the public meeting of the comprehensive plan amendments. Oh, public comment. Okay. Could ask, does anyone have a public comment? Oh, are there any public comments? Yes, right there. Okay, this is my first time here, so let me okay. state my name. State your name and your address, and then uh, just tell us what you Four want to address. talk about. Okay, my name is Fostoria Johnson. I live at 762 Southwest 11th Court in Oak Harbor, and I've lived there for over 20 years. So um, I'm here because I... Um, Can you move the microphone down? Oh, I'm sorry. Time? I am here because I have uh, noticed an increase of um, transits and homeless camps. And I've been really concerned because in living here over 20, actually 27 years I've been living here. I've been living at the address for about over 20. And I've noticed Hoffman Road. And my husband and I, who is a retired disabled veteran, we drove down there and it was very alarming, very disturbing. I know that people need help, but uh, it's very concerning, especially when you drive by there at night, you see a lot of traffic. Um, it's, it's very concerning. And I was informed not too long ago that they were going to um, put a spin cafe next to the movie theater. And so I know a lot of people are concerned about it and I'm one of them. And my question is, has anybody thought about the effect of the community with a facility like that right next to the theater, right across the street from, um, what is it, Dairy Queen? Uh, we already have, there's different spots in town where you see RVs or campers and it's very disturbing at times. Uh, my daughter's college in Seattle had a problem and myself and a few other parents uh, started making phone calls and making complaints because you had people who were very severely mentally ill going into the parking lots, screaming at the students while they were in their dorms, um, trash all over the place, uh, drug trafficking, increase of car theft, and so as a citizen who has been living here, a resident who has been living here for over 27 years, I'm very concerned. And I'm very concerned about how my tax money is being spent. And I just want to ask all of you guys, have, has anyone considered the effects of what it would look like to have a facility right there next to the theater where teenagers work, where teenagers go, right not too far from the beach, right not too far from a lot of things that are accessible to the community and people want to feel safe. I know that people need help, but what is there going to be security? I mean, what does that look like for us if there's already a problem going on right now? Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm.
Are, oh, there we go. Are there any other public comments? Hello, my name is Valerie Alanis. Um, I am not a city of Oak Harbor resident per se, but technically I am. I'm in the county, so like right outside of city limits. So that lets me segue into a follow up on the previous comment from Fostoria um, in terms of the homeless crisis that's happening as soon as you enter the city of Oak Harbor right there off of Hoffman Road. Um, <clears throat> I see that almost like every day. And I have seen that um, homeless camp um, just transform and evolve into um, what it is now, which is basically a neighborhood in itself. And um, I have the same general concern as Fostoria in the sense of, hu uh, I'm not sorry, I'm drug trafficking. Um, coming into uh, the city limits and these island limits as well. Um, I know Facebook is not an official uh, source when it comes to government uh, business matters, but just seeing uh, even middle schoolers and high schoolers getting caught up in just um, illegal drug activity is very concerning um, as a parent who has children within the school district system. Um, so I could continue to rant and ramble about just how I don't really like that. <clears throat> um, and I agree that we definitely need to get mental health uh, help to these people. Um, but what I also wanna propose is, because I've seen the agenda for today and I see what you guys are gonna be discussing, one of them, um, part C here, which is on 5C, Accessory Dwelling Unit Code Revisions. I haven't really looked at it um, very thoroughly, but uh, as a student myself over at Western Washington University, I am currently working with um, the Institute of Energy Studies where we are uh, modeling and designing um, a net zero tiny home. And that is with support from the Department of Energy. And it's actually in the process of being built right now. So they have provided open access um, when it comes to their patents and their designs. And I have also reached out to Think, which is Tiny Homes in the Name of Christ, down in South Whitby, who was recently on King 5 News in regards to their tiny home village that they just launched. Uh, I believe it was nine homes. Actually, yes, it was nine homes. And I called to follow up with them. And after speaking with one of their reps, um, basically what I learned was that uh, they had to design their own laws, their own zoning laws when it came to uh, these tiny home villages. And that if Oak Harbor wanted to, they could copy. Yeah, am I? Sorry, Is, am I at time? Yeah, oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, she just said that Oak Harbor could copy Langley's zoning code. And another thing that she mentioned was that um, if a city has land, they can actually gift it for free if it's in the name of low income housing. So there you go. Thank you for your comments. Uh, just a point of information, Hoffman Road is in the county. And so the county is the jurisdiction that controls what happens on, on, on that road. So that one's not a city function. But thank you for bringing it to our attention. Are there any other public comments? Seeing and hearing none, we can move on to the public hearing. And we don't have one tonight. OK. So then. We will move to the discussion item, starting with the comprehensive plan amendment. Good evening. Um, my name is Kat Kamak. I'm principal planner for Oak Harbor. And it's nice to be here after a long time. I'm usually at my desk giving a presentation. There are some conveniences on that, that I have access to a lot of monitors and information. Uh, but I don't have the face-to-face -face contact. 
Uh, now it's just the opposite. We're down on technology, and so here I am. It's good to see everybody. Um, I have a short presentation. I'm going to cover the active transportation plan under the uh, comprehensive plan because we, we're doing a lot of amendments, several topics, and active transportation plan is actually an amendment to our comprehensive plan. So I kind of tucked it under there so that the commission is aware that we're talking about these amendments throughout the year uh, before we get to the end of the year where we um, are making, taking some sort of action uh, to make the actual amendments. <clears throat> So what I wanted to share with the commission is some information on the active transportation plan. And if you noticed in all the material that I supplied to the commission, we have uh, the watermark draft on it. It is really a draft. It is actually the first draft. Actually, since I've sent it to you because we create our reports two to three weeks before the meeting, the information has already changed. So. But I just wanted to give the commission kind of a, a view into the process. So just uh, think of it in that way. Um, and if you do have um, a discussion or some questions on very detailed items, I would say just hold on to it. There'll be a subsequent meeting where I'll bring some updated information. And when we get closer to making recommendations, those discussions may be a little more pointed. Uh, but if you have questions or concerns and just want to kind of clear things up, feel free to bring it up. I don't have all the exhibits on my presentation. Uh, it's mostly all attachments that are uh, in your report. But if you have any reference to any particular page, we can kind of jump to it. And I'll try to address uh, any, any questions or comments that you have. Um, I have a quick presentation. I kind of build on my presentations throughout the year because I do give several presentations on the same topic. And so um, it helps if there are new members in the commission or if you haven't been at the meeting that you can kind of have a quick catch up. So I have slides from my previous uh, presentation which I will run through real quick. Uh, so that way we can all kind of like catch up to the, to the topics of discussion uh, that we have today. So, um, um, just to kind of give everybody uh, a kind of origin of this project, it started back in November last year. Uh, it, it's actually a, a grant-funded project. We hired Tool Design. Uh, this is a project that's, uh, because of its grant uh, source, we are supposed to contract with WashDOT. They are our lead agency. They oversee how we manage this project, and we have to report uh, a lot of our uh, uh, findings and progress to WashDOT on this project. Uh, so we got started uh, early this year, and we've been meeting with the consultants fairly regularly. Um, the project has been moving at a pretty good pace. We've had um, uh, several community engagement events. We had a tent at the Holland Happening. We've had steering committee meeting. Actually, we've had two. This is, uh, since I'm building off my original slides, at that time we had just only one, but we've had a steering committee since then. We've had focus groups. We've had communication on the web. Um, we're gonna have a walk, bike, ride uh, at some point in the process when we get eventually to the project list and maybe the planning commission would be interested in participating in something like that so that uh, we can actually go uh, with the consultants and see some of these streets, see the challenges, and talk about how uh, some solutions can help. Uh, there's an online virtual meeting that we're planning for in August, and uh, we also had an interactive web map um, along with the survey uh, between April and June. Um, so a lot of public engagement related to the plan. Um, this is kind of a summary of the timeline for our project. Uh, we are kind of um, close to the uh, steering committee. We already had two steering committee meetings. The third one is planned for in August. Um, so um, what are some of the things that we've looked at? Uh, of course, we had the uh, engagement plan um, that we just talked about. Uh, they looked at the existing conditions analysis, looked at the sidewalks inventory. I'll have some maps on that. Uh, they did some findings on uh, the, did some analysis on the network. Uh, and then how do we prioritize 
our uh, 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 network and, and what projects do we select, we kind of go through and look at the criteria based on which uh, we do that. And then you start describing the plan outline uh, and then you jump in goals and vision, uh, uh, the vision and goals. And these are things that are already happening and um, uh, at, at a very draft form. So in collecting data, they look at all our existing plans uh, to collect information. Um, this is all in your packet. Uh, this is some of the existing uh, facilities. Um, this is uh, where we have uh, crosswalks and so on so that you can get an inventory of our facilities. Um, we have existing uh, bikes and sharrows. Um, if you notice, they are still on the road. They're pretty faded, uh, but we do have, and this comes from our, uh, we have a, a, a comprehensive transportation plan that addresses automobiles, intersections, you know, all of that. And so uh, that had a very high level uh, identification of some bike lanes and so on. And so that was what was used to paint some of those sharrows and things like that that are existent today with the idea that a detailed plan will come later on. And that's what we'll kind of do on a little more detailed look at what we can do. Um, they looked at zoning, land use patterns. This determines how people bike and walk. Uh, in the city, where the land uses are, where are they going, how are they going to use it. So they're looking at that, and maybe they'll have some recommendations on some changes to that as well. Uh, this is a draft ATP vision, something simple to create a network that invites people of all ages and abilities to walk, bike, and roll throughout <coughs> or cover. Simple vision, um, but uh, it takes a lot to accomplish. Uh, they uh, started to give us some draft goals. Again, trying to keep it simple. Mobility, health, safety, equity. Those are the kind of four major topics uh, to address goals for this plan. Um, and then, again, going back to some of the data that they collected uh, in terms of, uh, you know, they, they have various methodologies in terms of how to uh, evaluate uh, the level of stress that you have at an intersection for either a pedestrian or a bike, uh, bicycle person. They put that all uh, into the network, and as you can see, uh, a lot of red spots along our arterial streets. That's where most of the stresses are. Highway 20, Midway Boulevard, Regatta, uh, Heller, Swan Town, Fort Nugent. Those are definitely all our arterial streets, and as we know, I think because they carry a high automobile uh, traffic, they do become uh, immediately um, hot spots for bikers and, and uh, uh, walkers because it's just not very convenient and friendly. Uh, this is bicycle level of stress. Uh, again, same pattern, mostly along arterial uh, streets. Uh, sidewalk coverage, this was another thing that the consultant did for us. They went throughout the city and tried to map out where we do have sidewalks on one side of the street or on both sides or on none. And so uh, that kind of gives us an idea of uh, where there's a lack of infrastructure. And as you can see, east of um, Highway 20 and some of the older neighborhoods, we do have narrow streets. You know, the old um, uh, cross-section with ditches uh, those are challenging to work with, so, um, but it's good to start identifying those so you can develop some sort of a long-term strategy in terms of how you want to address them. Um, so now we're getting, th th those are the slides that I kind of covered at the last uh, update to the Planning Commission. Since then, we've, like I said, we've had some uh, public engagement processes. Um, uh, this is one of the focus groups with the Whidbey Bicycle Club. We had a lot of good input from them. Um, so um, we also had that booth. Uh, we had more than 300 people stop at the, at the booth and, and chat with the city about <coughs> the efforts. Uh, some of the survey results, uh, I don't have, again, this is all draft form. I got some initial um, uh, graphs from the consultants on some of the results. I don't have a compiled report yet on all the answers. I'm hoping to get that, and of course, that'll come later on. But this is, I wanted to share what they shared with us. Again, like I said, this is just kind of a, 
a view into the process. So uh, the nice thing to note in some of the responses is that most of the people that respond to the survey live in Oak Harbor or they shop here or they do something here. It's not a very touristy survey where some, you know, most of the people are from somewhere else. Um, we did get uh, a fair number of responses from people with disabilities, so that's uh, very good uh, uh, that we got some responses from them. Um, some of the, um, what kind of, uh, I think some of the survey questions uh, provided some photos in terms of uh, how to improve your experience walking in Oak Harbor, and of course, uh, most sidewalks uh, definitely came up as uh, top of the list. And, uh, you know, what are the things that you, uh, should be done to improve the experience for biking? And, um, you know, the, uh, the bike lanes and separated bike lanes um, are the ones that kind of came up to the top in terms of what people would like. Um, again, here, um, you know, what are they most comfortable in? Shared use path, sidewalk, asphalt, walkways. These are all uh, were related to photographs. And you can see that people preferred in, for both biking and walking, something that's very dedicated for that purpose so that they feel safe. So uh, that's definitely the preference. Um, and so uh, hopefully that will uh, impact or flow into our uh, projects and how we select them and how we design them in order to incorporate more facilities like this because that's what the public prefers. Um, so the, we also had a interactive map online where people could go geographically and pick an intersection or an area where they thought that there was infrastructure lacking or something that they'd like to see or to let, people, or to let us know where they usually go for biking and walking and what do they do. So there was a lot of data points that were provided, which is great. Um, uh, I think these are in the packet attached in terms of uh, destinations where people go um, for biking um, and we can see that there's a lot of them that go to downtown but we also have a lot along Fort Nugent and some loops uh, uh, around the golf course um, seems like networks to capture this is a uh, walking destinations again we see a lot of it uh, mostly in Wind General Park and downtown which is great uh, which is where we should probably look at uh, enhancing uh, our pedestrian networks. Uh, bike destinations, uh, again, it's really nice to see that some of the area, the Barrington um, and the Walmart Safeway seems to be a destination that people would like to bike to. There's a lot of uh, input on that. Uh, biking barriers, uh, people, pro, uh, you know, had a lot of comments, again, uh, on a lot of intersections, and these will be compiled for the commission later on. This is just um, graphically what has been shared with us, and I'm just passing that on to you. Uh, again, walking barriers. So these are the things from, uh, these are uh, data points from the um, analysis that came out and from the survey. Um, I do have attachments in the packet for um, uh, policy recommendations and programs and catalyst list of projects. Again, those are very draft. They are already changed. When we went to the second steering committee, which was after I sent the planning commission packet out, they had a lot of comments and a lot of those lists have already uh, been changed. So if you have comments, great. Um, if you can capture them and send them to me in an email, that would be awesome. I can forward that to, the, to our uh, consultants so that they can incorporate that. But I just want to say again, those are all in draft, so I didn't put them on the slides for us to go through and, and chat, but I did want to share with the commission. So for example, I'll say um, on the Catalyst projects, I think the list that the Planning Commission has has six projects listed. When we went to the steering committee, they really felt, I think, that the third and fourth avenue should also be added as one of those projects. And so there's a seventh project added, and I tell you before I come to you the next time, there may be projects added or taken out. There's a lot of good discussion going on, um, um, uh, you know, to what level, uh, how do we want to do successful projects. You know, almost every street uh, can be a network. 
uh, for pedestrian and bicycle? You know, how do we choose, um, you know, what's, what would make sense at this given time? Uh, what, is, what are the projects that we can do um, with uh, very little cost and have an impact and get this to uh, be successful so that you can kind of uh, add more projects as time goes. So um, we're not looking for something that's going to try and solve all of the intersection issues. We'll try and list and capture a lot of our barriers. And solutions will come based on complaints, based on funding, based on opportunity. Um, but these catalyst projects are just uh, some of the surface projects that we want to try and do um, so that you can kind of um, get a network started successfully without having to spend a lot of money. So some um, streets that you may think normally could benefit from improvements may not be on that list, even though they may be identified as a, a street that may need some improvements. That's primarily because the resources needed may be too large. So if you try and put that into a project, you may not succeed right out of the bat. You want to get some projects going. You want to get people biking, walking, and uh, experiencing that. And then over time, you kind of build on that, uh, uh, on that use and their support uh, to add more projects. So again, it's just a draft form. Things will change. I will try to provide you with more information as time goes, uh, just be aware that uh, some of this information uh, will change. Uh, but with that, I will stop and um, open it up to the Commission for any questions, uh, comments, and we'll uh, try and address them as best as we can. You want some specifics, even if I put it in, in an email later? Sure. We can talk about it, absolutely. Okay. Um, if I understood correctly, on O'Leary and Pasek, it looked as though both directions are sharing one lane. Did I understand that correctly? Um, there's potential, so... I was worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right. So I think the active transportation plan is going to provide us with a lot of tools to address um, how we take tackle biking and pedestrian, right? There's uh, numerous tools, and some of the tools, for example, one of the tools is to remove striping from the streets, right? So that it creates some sort of, uh, when you have lanes, there's a, certain, there's a sense of ownership. You know, so, uh, you know, so I'm going to drive as fast as I can because this is my lane, this is I'm on the right side, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when you remove those lanes, there's a sense of sharedness that comes from it, and, um, and there's some slowing now because of a little bit of confusion in terms of who has, you know. So you, you kind of are introducing a little bit of different toolkit that people are used to in order to slow traffic down um, for everybody. Um, so s maybe what I think you're referring to is an option to where you have bike lanes on both sides, you don't have adequate right of way, so two cars coming from opposite side, one of them will have to wait for the other to go through. And on a residential street that has, doesn't have as much traffic, I think that's an okay tool to use where you don't have enough right of way. So O'Leary has a large, you know, wide right of way from on the north side, but then as you come closer to south of Whidbey, the cross section narrows down, but you want to con continue that network. So, what are the tools that you can use? Because you lose sidewalks, you get into a, a ditch uh, cross section, you have to use the road. How do you use that? Can you use at grade uh, walking? You know, with these striping. So, you have to get creative uh, in order to connect uh, these networks where infrastructure is not there. Yeah. Years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it might be wise to set up a couple of um, experimental samples to see what people here would do with that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's why this plan is going to bring on new things. So we want to try and get a couple successful projects where we, we can put in 
some of these measures, maybe one project in, and start having people use it and get used to it before you start to move. When roundabouts came first, people were confused. A lot of people didn't like them. But once you get used to it, you see the benefit of, uh, of a roundabout. So it's just going to take a little bit of adjustment for people to accommodate um, biking and walking in such a way. We also want to do it, in, so Highway 20 is one of the projects that's listed on there, but it, Highway 20 is not city, city road, it's a state highway. But we're state, we have the state at the table, uh, at our steering committee, we have them at the RTPO, and they're fully aware of our plan, and they know that whatever we put in our plan is going to be the basis from which they will design. So they're not going to ignore Oak Harbor and just do their own thing. Uh, they're validating our ideas and plans. So the more, uh, so for Highway 20, what we'll do is probably capture some concepts. We're not going to design it. We don't want to spend the money to design it. Watchdog will design it when they do the project. But we want to talk about roundabouts. We don't want to talk. We want to talk about slowing down. We may want to talk about bike lane on each side. Some of these specifications will then lead into when washout designs, we have an adopted plan that will help them uh, do the design. So uh, some streets will get some, hopefully some more detailed plans so that you know we can start a network with signage and some striping. And then others will have to wait for some funding to come through because we may have to cross Highway 20 or you know those kind of intersections get challenging when you have one way high speed and you got you're slowing down the other lane you got to you know so they you know you can call for traffic light um, delays you know uh, so that bikes and pedestrians can get the first chance and these things are slowly going to first people are not going to like it but over time you just adjust to it um, when when you start to implement and people get out and enjoy the benefits of having such networks We absolutely we have I think um, the super not not superintendent but the oh, yes. public works or one of the assistant superintendent who's in charge of the public facilities I think is part of our steering committee and we also have a, a, a person that's in the bicycle would be bicycle club who's also a teacher and I think she was talking about the program that you mentioned. Anyone else have comments? Yeah, I'll, one thing that I noticed, right, and I'm looking at the Midway Boulevard cross sections, um, something that I am drawn to, and I think synthesizes well with the mm -hmm. surveys, right, is, and kind of connects to this idea of ownership of the road and kind of removing those barriers. It might be useful or, or interesting to try to figure out what it would, or how much additional cost to instead of putting up like a bollard and having kind of the bike lane part of the street on that same elevation but separated by striping or you know uh, bollards instead try to see what it would take to raise it up so that it becomes part of kind of a combined sidewalk bike lane type situation I feel like that at least I don't have any specific information about like if that reduces incidents but I feel like colloquially having kind of that separation of elevation and having kind of pedestrians and bicycles kind of combined into one route and then having automobiles kind of in that street level I think that might be a way to combine those things and combine what the survey looked like it was indicating of people wanting kind of that shared pedestrian bike facility. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, yes. Aesthetically, it would be better. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Aesthetically, it would look like what you were saying. If you just had like 
the bike lane and the sidewalk being raised, so essentially a, a real wide sidewalk that was part bike lane, part that. Um, aesthetically, that would look a lot better driving down it than a whole driving down with bollards on each side like that was proposed here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And um, so the, there are two projects that I actually got some grant funding. So the Midway Boulevard actually has some grant funding down by 2028 from the RTPO, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and so those are um, projects that we probably won't spend a lot of effort designing it with this plan because there's going to be money that's going to come and you're better off just spending more of your, your details there. Right. We don't know uh, yet whether we want to uh, do a major construction project or whether it's it's a lower cost project to try and reduce the number of lanes and slow the traffic down. So those are things that'll play, but if, if the grant money is available for something that what you're talking about, and I think that's what the plan talks about is we like the separated bike lanes, uh, separated grade, you know, and I think that's what would be preferable, but I think when it comes down to the project at that time, whatever funding is available in terms of uh, 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 what it would cost, and then also mm -hmm. utilities, you know. Anytime you, you start to widen sidewalks or do something, you have to look at whether there are storm utilities there or some other utilities that will be impacted. And so all of that will play into, into how Midway is going to be transformed. Mm -hmm. But I think every chance they get, they'll hopefully go for the separated uh, separated pathways, but a lot of it may be budget driven. Midway is a challenging, not not easy. The sections of it are easier than others, but once you get closer to the Whidbey intersection and with all that commercial building there, mm -hmm. it starts to get a little more um, complicated because there are, there are parking um, um, challenges that uh, don't have any regulated way of how they enter the right of way. And so those things can be dangerous for pedestrians and bikers. So we want to maintain a certain amount of comfort level from the start to finish. Uh, we don't want to get them very comfortable. And then, you know, sh the, the, there's a kind of like you go from a, a very protected share lane, and if you go on to a share or something like that, I think there's a little bit of uh, a fear factor in terms of the jump of the type of facility you could have on the thing. So I think hopefully that will all play into when they eventually design that, but great, uh, it would be great to see that, to see a separated uh, bike lane there, uh, definitely. So I wanna add on to what both of you guys are pointing out. Also, studies show that, um, I don't know the correct term for them, bollards is one thing, painted stripes, those are all great things. But what actually slows people down and makes at least pedestrians feel safer on sidewalks is a like a true barrier, whether that's like a plant barrier. So having plants in the middle makes it more of a welcoming environment that increases either bicycles or people walking. Um, and I think some great plans, for example, is the city of Bellingham had quite a few in their bicycle program where they essentially where cars would be parking they make portions of that area like a crosswalk have more vegetative space and more of a buffer there so people feel free to walk back and forth while still paying attention to that traffic they also then have um they make those plant areas smaller where parking would be available so then they essentially you're clearing a safer spot for cars to pull over on the side of the road while also still protecting those separated lanes for um, bicyclists and pedestrians walking. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely, would... great idea. I think, if I remember right, one of the cross sections for the Bayshore Pioneer Way has some of those, you know, that's one of the projects that I'm kind of excited about because you can turn, we, we have enough right away, you don't have to do major construction. You could do striping and signage and get get a good wide um, uh, kind of multi-use, you know, bike and pedestrian lane 
and you can have barriers and you know and still have parking maybe on one side and we still we were, we were still doing the pros and cons at our last discussion on whether that parking should be on the south side or the north side and how it'll be beneficial what slows people down so it's still you know a lot of it is still under discussion but mm -hmm. that's maybe some of the ideas that you know anytime we can separate it that's great uh, it may not be realistic in a lot of our options but that's definitely in our toolkit whenever we can um, and that's the uh, that's a good point so, good ideas Anyone else have any comments on this? Thank you for all the work you're yep. putting into it. Oh yeah, yeah. This, it's still ongoing. I'm excited. Uh, I'll next, uh, at, uh, very soon I'll be bringing in more uh, material on this and we'll be getting uh, our next steering committee meeting is on August 17th, I believe. Uh, virtual, we have also a virtual meeting which we're promoting. So we'll get a lot of public input and then we'll kind of narrow down onto our project list and our policies and so on. And so I'm excited to bring that probably around the September time frame. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. We'll cover it some other time. All right, we'll move on to the next discussion topic. Which is the county-wide planning policy? Okay. And that's, that'll be me again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so this, this is also a comprehensive plan amendment, uh, but I just listed it separately because it's a new topic that we're going to discuss. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that, so I kind of pulled that out as a separate item. Um, so the county-wide planning policies, and I've attached the current countywide planning policies to your uh, packet and also a couple attachments um, from the state in terms of our um, housing needs. And so we'll just um, touch upon it just at a very high level. Um, we are currently in uh, discussion with Island County and the other jurisdictions in terms of um, how, uh, what's the best way, uh, what are the things that we should amend in our policies because there are some uh, uh, procedures that we, is very specific in the countywide planning policies if you want to amend them, what do you do during the annual updates? And so uh, there's a group of staff that is gathering to kind of look at all of that and bring it to the planning commission and the city council. All the jurisdictions will be kind of tackling this because this is a topic what the state says is you need to all the the county needs to adopt or must adopt countywide planning policies and it must be done in collaboration and cooperation with all the jurisdictions so everybody in the on the island will be soon talking about it uh, there's a potential that we won't have our july meeting and i might not be here for the august meeting so i didn't want to bring this topic very late in the process so i'm going to just introduce this mm -hmm. topic to you today so that you have the information and it's not new. We don't have any of the details yet and I will be bringing that back to you either in August or September. But I just wanted to um, kind of put the seed in your mind about this topic uh, so that you have some information and you're familiar with it. So countywide planning policies, this is a uh, where does it come from? The origins, it comes from the Growth Management Act, um, the countywide planning policies for Island County was first adopted in 92, and then it was amended several times, 98, 99, 2015, 2017. Um, I don't know all the details of those amendments, but um, they uh, are usually centered around uh, some major issues, and if you think about the history between in Island County, a lot of these uh, come from uh, usually um, uh, UGA boundary uh, and uh, JPA boundaries and those kind of, uh, those are most of the interesting issues around countywide planning policies and those are the ones that usually lead to a lot of changes uh, to them. So um, as I mentioned, GMA requires that 
uh, county subject to, uh, to GMA, uh, which Island County is, must adapt, uh, adopt these policies and that these policies should be adopted uh, or developed in cooperation with the municipalities. And we have a working group in Island County uh, that actually works on these. So there are uh, policy documents to establish a, a framework for county and municipal comprehensive plans uh, to be developed. So this is a, actually, you know, it's a, it's a very high level document that feeds into the comprehensive plans of all these jurisdictions. So it's a fairly important document in terms of collaboration and what it does for the city. Uh, so they intended to uh, promote uh, or coordinate uh, 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 communication between governmental agencies uh, and to prevent conflicting actions and uh, mainly also to provide orderly growth. So most of the, when, when GMA came about and set UGAs, um, it, it, it established the many years of what will come. Uh, so as Washington grows, as the cities in Washington grow, these policies will become more and more important uh, to discuss because these will determine whether how a city is going to expand, how much the city is going to expand, which direction it's going to expand. And there's a lot of things that the state uh, requires counties and cities to do through these requirements. So what does the current uh, countywide planning policies have? And I have that document to you. It has a list of planning goals. It's like a planning document in terms of what these policies needs to achieve. And then there are various policies uh, that uh, have been listed for the various topics uh, of interest. So you have policies on the joint planning area, on the urban growth area, urban rural development. So there's a list of policies. And then there's an admin and implementation uh, section that talks about how to amend these, uh, amend policies, because these have been done in the past in various forms. Uh, inconsistent forms sometimes, just because of our issues come up, and so the, the policies now have been refined over time uh, to try and address some of the previous challenges uh, that they had with the process. So now we have a process for amending them. It talks about um, how to do um, the land capacity analysis and the population projection. Uh, this is just as a history side story. This was one of the biggest issues back in 2005 where there was a disagreement between uh, the county and the city in terms of population projection. So the city was choosing to have a higher population projection because it was before the the, the big economic drop in 2008 or 2007, uh, you know, when everything was going well in the 2003s, 2004, a lot of building permits were being issued. So the city was expecting to grow much faster and, and was uh, projecting for a higher population, whereas Island County didn't think that uh, there was that much population that the Island County can accommodate. So they adopted a very different number and both went on to do what they do with those numbers, but eventually came to countywide planning policies, there's discrepancies, we couldn't agree on UGA boundaries, and so that led to other uh, GMA appeals and so on that finally established that the county is the keeper of the line for the UGA because Oak Harbor wanted to expand the UGA based on its population projection, which included a certain area. But the county did had a separate number and it didn't match. And so whose boundary, who has the correct boundary? That's the legal case that was set here in Washington that established that it's the county's line to draw, of course, in cooperation with the city. So that set forth all the policies and the procedures that we have today. So in order to do our land capacity analysis, in order to expand our UGA, we have to go through a process uh, because the state requires us to do so. And um, so we use these policies as a basis to try and address those methodologies. So we do have um, some changes that we are going to recommend. We're currently looking at it with all the other jurisdictions in terms of what to amend in these policies. So I've given you some um, uh, attachments in your packet in terms of what the state requires. So 
they are, if you read through that, and it, is, it seems like a technical document, but even if you read the first page of the introduction of the purpose, it tells you clearly that the state is requiring cities and counties to incorporate a tool for accommodating affordable housing. They are predicting what population that you should choose from. If you choose this population, then these are the housing counts that you have to aim for. So everything is coming to us prescribed. However, there's a couple of methodologies they want us to choose from, and these are things that we are working with other jurisdictions to see which, which one makes sense for us as Island County, uh, and then to come back to Planning Commission and City Council uh, to amend the countywide planning policy. So more details to come. We don't have uh, that information sorted yet, but I just wanted to let you know that we're going to try and tackle some amendments to the countywide planning policy. And I just want to let you know about the inclusion of that affordable housing um, um, sort of methodology into the po policies. So what the state is saying is put it in your policies and everybody agrees to it and then do the calculations based on that. So you have uh, something that everybody goes by and you don't have a difference in, in expectations. So. Um, that's all I have um, on this topic. Um, again, like I said, I'll come back with a little more information once we work with our um, neighboring agencies on, you know, uh, more of the details related to this. So, uh, questions, comments? Yes. Um, I needed a clarification about the population of the city. Um, it sounded as though we would not have to do certain things because it's not said we are not at 25,000 yet. But if we are at 25,000, then we have to follow other recommendations. And it seems to me that it would be foolish to set a lower figure if we know the higher figure and those policies are going to come. So, and are we maybe or not? Is that part of the <laughs> Absolutely. You bring up a great question because that is going to segue a little bit into what Ray is going to talk about in terms of ADU, I think. We are not to 25,000 yet, as per the official Office of Financial Management um, projections for this year. Um, we are close. We're 24,670. I think I'm just, uh, don't quote me on this. I think it was somewhere pretty close. Um, so we are also of the same thought that, um, but it gives us time to think about some of the changes we want to make. So that's beneficial, but our thought is similar. We might as well just plan uh, for what the cities of 25,000 are expected to do uh, so that you know, we don't have to do too many changes when we do trigger that. Um, so some of that thinking is already in our, in our work. So mm -hmm. um, when, uh, when we talk about some of these density changes that they're talking about, the 25,000 and plus, it does affect our uh, zoning code and, and our housing. So we're still doing a lot of uh, changes, uh, implementing our housing action plan, which is what Ray is uh, gonna talk to you about. And so uh, some of it uh, will address your, your concerns. Well, do the Navy housing areas, are they part of Ocarver? I know they're on Navy land. Yeah, uh, the, so the, the base itself Mm -hmm. On field is not in the city. The seaplane base is in the city, and their population is counted into Oak Harbor's population. What about East Fresno Harbor Road? The seaplane base goes all the way to, yeah, yeah all it's all in the city. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they're all included in, in Oak Harbor. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Mm -hmm. No? All right. Thank you. All right. So we'll move on to the next discussion item of accessory dwelling units code revisions. Thank you. I'm Ray Lindenberg, senior planner, and I'm usually presenting from downstairs, so this is the first time I've met all of you. Hello. Um, I was planning on doing an entirely different type of presentation, and Tim, you don't even need to worry about mine, so... Yeah, I was. Whatever. So, um, as CAC mentioned, uh, there was that whole 25,000 
population threshold, and we discussed mm -hmm. that a little bit. Um, the last time I made a presentation was in April. A couple of you, I think, are new since that time. So you don't need to even worry about that because what's happening now is that presentation and that ordinance uh, draft that we did is kind of on hold for right now. Um, what happened since that time uh, is that the state uh, legislature approved a couple of bills that have really kind of thrown everything up in the air. And those two bills, or actually three bills, I, I included on your staff report packet there. The two important ones are 1110 and 1337. And I'll discuss those a little bit for right now, but pretty much the, the crux of my presentation tonight is don't worry about this for now. We're going to be looking into it, talking to our, our legal experts and finding out exactly what it is we need to do because that whole 25,000 threshold, we're not there yet, but we're going to be and we should plan ahead as we talked about. So mm -hmm. um, 1110 is the one that uh, directly talks about the 25,000 person threshold. And that one has some standards in it that we probably meet right now and that's also why we're not too concerned about um, you know making changes just for the sake of making changes currently our ADU code is super permissive when we went through this before and and discussed it and reviewed it against our peer cities that are about the same population in the state um, we found that uh, our lack of uh, square footage maximums and our parking standards and all those sorts of things made it super easy to get a, an ADU in this city. The only thing that our code doesn't have is a standard for square footage for detached ADUs. We need that. Uh, that should be there. So what we've done is we made the interpretation that the detached ADU is similar to a detached structure which has a 600 square foot maximum uh, floor area. So we have that de facto in there. We haven't had to use it. We don't have people knocking down the doors to get ADUs anyway right now. So we're going to kind of continue forward in that path, do some research with this new, uh, these new regulations that have come down from the state and then determine the best course of action. Because the original thought was, is that if our ADU code is very similar to a duplex, and really the only difference to the duplex was the number of parking spaces that are required, then why not just call it a duplex? And that is kind of what the state is telling us anyway, is that we are required now to have two units available on all residential lots, at least, and possibly four or more. And when I read it originally, I thought it said up to four. It actually says at least four, if you provide affordable housing. And the key thing is, is they have a long list of standards for what affordable housing is, and it's a 50-year contract, essentially. So I don't see that being a huge demand right now, um, but it's still something we have to prepare for. And so that's kind of what 1110 talks about, that cities of at least 25,000. It discusses um, not or it discusses allowing at least four units per acre on all uh, lots zoned predominantly for residential use um, if it's within a quarter mile of a major transit stop. And what a major transit stop is, I've read the definition, I believe that means like a light rail or a heavy rail kind of situation or a bus rapid transit. None of these things that we have in our community, so I think we can kind of set that one aside. But it does still talk about um, density of at least four units per acre if you provide at least one of those units as affordable housing. So that's something we need to look at and make sure that we're, our code reflects that and addresses that. And one of the things that uh, CAC and I have discussed, um, CAC suggested just referencing this code section so we don't ever have to change our code. If they change it, then ours changes along with it. So that's something that we can consider as well. Um, the other thing that we had to uh, deal with uh, as an alternative to the density requirements, we can make other changes uh, that allow for at least 75% of the lots in the city um, that uh, we would change the density on that to allow for that. We already changed the density a little bit to allow up to nine units per acre in the R1 zone district. So we just need to kind of go through and make sure that everything is lining up with these code requirements. And then it also says that the city must allow at least six of the nine types of middle housing. And so we have to figure out, do we do that? Um, so this is starting to, you know, it, at first we were just talking about doing this little code amendment and then it just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and now it's huge. 
So this is going to be probably a, a several month process for us on our side. And I wanted to make sure that uh, you all didn't think we'd just forgotten about it and walked away from it. So that's, that's my presentation today. Um, and then talking about a little bit about 1337 as well. Um, that section talks about some standards of not, re or not allowing uh, impact fees on ADUs. Um, we can't require that the owner live on site, which is one of the changes we made previously, so we're already in compliance there. Um, this one does say that we must allow at least two dwelling units, or two accessory dwelling units on every lot. So that's three. We went from two here to three here. So we're starting to stack in a density a little bit. So what we want to do is make sure that we are getting out in front of this as far as the 25,000 requirement and trying to design something that fits for the city of Oak Harbor and not just take what's given to us kind of thing. And that was something that uh, Councilman Wiesner brought up at our last meeting too. So that's where we're headed. I'm available for any questions. So the, um, so the density on a lot is in direct conflict with percentage of coverage <laughs> of a lot. Can you talk about that? Certainly. Um, pretty much what that means, you're gonna have very tall houses. Oh, so it would stick on them. So yeah, what our code says right now, we have a 45% lot coverage. And my original proposal for the, the draft ADU that you didn't see um, was to allow essentially a density bonus. If you did an ADU, you could go up to 55%. So that was a little bit more to work with, a little bit more space. But the fact is that, you know, I mean, you've seen the recent development. You've seen the McKinney Place over uh, behind the intermediate school. You've seen, uh, Gosh, what's the one out on Fort Nugent? But you see these narrow houses, tall, kind of compact on the lot, and that's really the wave of the future. We're seeing two two story houses now, you're gonna start seeing three story houses because that's the only way that these are going to work in a lot of cases. That being said, this these requirements say specifically that it does not prevent us from allowing single family residential units. So if somebody wants to come in and they have 10 acre parcel of land and they want to put lots on there that meet the, the three to nine units per acre, they can still do that. So they can still do 10, 12,000 square foot lots if they want to. We just have to allow for the greater density to allow for that uh, increase in population. We don't have to require it. So that's, a, that's an important thing too. And we don't have any requirements about heights in terms of somebody blocking somebody else's Right. We, we do have a height limitation of 35 feet, but we don't protect specifically views. If it just so happens that you're building your 34 foot tall house that blocks the view of Mount Baker, there's not a lot we can do about that. Welcome to the big city, right? <laughs> Anyone else have any comments, questions? Was there, yeah, is it, so as you're saying, the wave of the future is three story houses or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, is that gonna change your height or we'll have to change that? You know, um, that's a possibility. I think the thing is about it, um, 35 feet is the, the average height. So you could still do a peaked roof that's a little bit higher than 35 feet. You could probably finagle a three story house into that. Um, and depending on slopes and things. Mm -hmm. um, it might be something that we have to take a look at later on down the road. It's, it's one of those things, I think that in particular, that requirement in particular, is going to really depend on the demand. Like if we start seeing a whole bunch of demand for you know people coming in with three-story houses and multiple ADUs and things like that, then yeah, we're gonna have to change, we're gonna have to pivot pretty quickly. And to be perfectly honest, uh, a height limit change is pretty easy as far as going through a process, right? Okay. But right now, um, two-story houses are the norm. You know, one-story houses are still happening. So uh, I don't think, and like I said, nobody's beating down the doors for multiple ADUs right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe if uh, the county holds us to an, uh, an urban growth area that doesn't move or something like that, we have to densify significantly, maybe that'll start happening. But we're still, I mean, I, I joke about welcome to the big city. We are in a transition period from small town to city at this point, but we are nowhere near, you know, building <clears throat> multiple story apartment buildings and things like that of more than, you know, four or five, six stories, things like that. We're not gonna see the parking garages right. with, with stacks on top of that, so. Do 
Just to answer your question, yeah, they can build three stories within 35 feet. Okay. We see it at the county more often now. So, um, without any more questions, comments, we'll move on to the topic of canceling the July 25th, 2023 meeting. Chairman Bonson, members of the Planning Commission, David Cool, Development Services Director. Today we would like to propose to you that we cancel the meeting for July. Um, welcome to the Planning Commission for the new members. Uh, <laughs> at your first meeting, you get to cancel the next meeting. Uh, the challenge we're having internally is staffing. Uh, we've had a lot of people on leave for a variety of reasons. And this is vacation season, and so we're trying to make sure we can staff the Planning Commission. We do a lot of work before we get here. Uh, those of you who work in the industry know that there's a lot of time spent to get things ready, uh, to get uh, set up for these Planning Commission meetings. So um, we have a lot of work to do still, uh, so we'll continue to work on items behind the scenes and get them ready for you uh, in August, at our meeting on August 22nd. So our request uh, is that the recommended motion is to uh, move that the July 25th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting be canceled. We're available for any questions you might have. Uh, second. He made the motion. So one of you will have to make the motion and okay. another one will second it. Uh, I'll make the motion, ask Steve. Is that good? Or does she have to read the whole motion? I would read the motion. Do you have it in front of you? No. Oh. oh yeah, okay, it's on. under, oh, wait. If this is here, wait. It's in the packet. Here, I got it. I have Go it right here. It says, I move that the July 25th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting be canceled. Second. <laughs> All right, now we'll move on to the monthly department report. Oh, yeah, okay. Forgot about that. We have to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? It's unanimous, yeah. Okay, so that one passed unanimously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we can move on to the monthly department report. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just for information for the new Planning Commissioners, uh, in the past, the Planning Commission used to work on a lot of day-to-day -day projects. They did a lot of review of site plans and buildings. And since that time, we've gone to a hearing examiner form of uh, review. And so a lot of those cases no longer go to the Planning Commission. So a lot of what you do is legislative actions. Uh, you work on laws and other code changes. So I started creating this report so that you could see the other things that are happening in the department as well as in the city. And uh, if you have this up on your attachment, um, I'm not sure which page number it is, but it's uh, the, the last item. 155. Um, we're doing a lot more long-range planning. Uh, things like the uh, community rating system is something that's coming up. Uh, we have our retired, soft retired planner, Dennis Lefevre, working on that, and that's a FEMA program uh, that we see that would be of great benefit to us. The multifamily tax exemption program is one I want to get in front of you real soon. Uh, so I'll see, you'll see that on the August 22nd meeting. And I might send some information out to you before that time so you can at least start learning about what the program's about. Uh, the things that you'll do at that meeting is you'll pick what's called a residential target area. And that's where you're gonna pick the area of town that you want to see multifamily tax exemptions created. And you'll pick basically uh, areas or lots, uh, how, you th how you see that working. And our consultant is working on that and, and you'll get a chance to discuss that with him. But that's important because we need to get that started uh, in a review in a work session in August and get it in front of you for an ordinance in September at a public hearing. So we have to move a little quicker on that. Um, we've also uh, we've approved the SEPA exemptions and that was kind of a big deal for us to get that finally done. Uh, we've done some building code text amendments and some other things. And as you learned tonight, uh, the 2025 comp plan that 
uh, CAC is working on uh, starts now, so there's a lot of work going into that uh, to get ready for that. Countywide planning policies, we talked about that tonight, as well as accessory dwelling units. So a lot of things we're doing, and uh, we'll certainly bring new things to you as well. We're also working with the Main Street Group. Uh, there's a lane called Serendipity Lane, and if you want some information on that, I can bring that back at a future meeting so you can see what the details are on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a lane in downtown to try and tie the area of Pioneer down to Bayshore so that people can circulate better. Uh, so we're co coordinating with downtown, uh, with Main Street, uh, to work on a sub-area plan as on the downtown area. And we're also doing a lot of uh, historic structures uh, with the uh, Historic Preservation Commission and try and get that uh, group going again. So those are what we're working on uh, more recently. Uh, the attached chart is just a list of all the projects we're working on with the statuses. Uh, so you can see when they came in, uh, how long we've had them, what type of project they are, and, uh, and what the next steps are. So you get an idea, a snapshot of everything that's happening in town in terms of uh, current planning, current development. And that's uh, our report for today. Thank you. Anyone have comments or questions? Mm -mm. It does. <laughs> All right, so I'll call the meeting. Does there have to be a motion to adjourn the meeting? I've seen it done both ways. You can just adjourn the meeting or request a motion to adjourn. I'll just adjourn the meeting at 712. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank <laughs> you.